Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You are here because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and amazing ideas that are gonna help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest defies the convention of all my normal intros. Reading a list of his accomplishments would be to miss the point entirely. While he is the Emmy-nominated host of Brain Games, the highest rated show in Nat Geo's history, airing in 45 languages across 171 countries, this modern day performance philosopher and filmmaker cannot be described in terms of demographics and viewership. He must be experienced. You have to let him crawl inside your mind, clear the cobwebs, and paint on the walls of your brain like an artistic cave dweller, showing you a vision of the world not as it is, but as it could be. His infectious optimism has earned him the name of Wonder Junkie, but from where I'm sitting, he is the Wonder Dealer. His shots of awe will leave anyone scratching for more. He spins ideas into a magical tapestry of intellectual ecstasy like an Ibiza DJ in the height of their powers. His beautiful, transcendent, and paradigm-shifting micro-documentaries may be born out of existential anxiety, but they so manifestly capture the agony and ecstasy of the human experience that they've been viewed over 100 million times. His poetic, cosmological musings smash together Shakespearean drama with Sagan-esque profundity like the Hadron Collider smashes particles, resulting in the same degree of revelatory fireworks. So please, help me in welcoming the host of the all-new National Geographic show about the birth and rise of the human species itself, Origins. The one, and I assure you only, Jason Silva. Mother, welcome. It's so good to have you here. Thank you for having me back. Man. Absolutely. I, uh, thank you for that introduction. <laughs> that is that is truly truly a pleasure. Writing wow. that for you, you have no idea. That was the most fun I've ever had. Writing an intro, I was a Thank wee you. bit um, indulgent in my desire to have beautiful language. I, I, but I think you warrant it. You know, I, I appreciate that, and um, and it gives me chills to know that my work has touched you that way, mm -hmm. because I sense a kindred spirit, mm -hmm. and something that I share with you is an enthusiasm to celebrate those mm. that have touched me and inspired me. Um, you've heard me ranting and raving about <laughs> Stephen Kotler and mm. Jamie Wheel and the folks behind Neurohacker that I was telling you about before. Um, and I, I can't overemphasize my passion for those that have affected me. And I think a lot of the fuel for my work is simply a desire to give back in some fundamental way. Like I have been shaken by literature and ideas and media and film and individuals across the world and I have been shaken and touched with such a sort of profound intensity that I have had no choice but to respond in some way. You know, my favorite, one of my favorite thinkers, Ernest Becker, used to say the difference between the artist and the neurotic is that the, the neurotic is precisely the one who cannot create and so he chokes in his introversion. Oh, that's actually but, really interesting. Yeah, but the neurotic and the artist are both super sensitive. They both take in the world with intensity. But again, the neurotic cannot create, so he chokes on his introversions. Whereas the artist takes in the world and reworks it into his art. And, and so that, that's really my attempt and my inspiration. But you know, I see that you are in turn doing that as well, because I sensed artistry in your passion. So thank you for that intro. Dude, Thank you. Truly, uh, my pleasure. And <laughs> one of the things that you lend credence to in a way that I love is the notion of a, being an artist being such a valid form of expression. So growing up in the 80s anyway, artists were made fun of, right? And that was if you wanted to like paint the picture of the boyfriend who was not worthy of the daughter in a movie, you just made him an artist, right? Okay. And that was uh, yeah. an easy way to dismiss him. To dismiss somebody because if you couldn't sell it, if it couldn't be turned into a commodity that, was, that, was, that had value in our capitalist system, then it was dismissed. Oh, he's yeah. just a struggling artist, something yeah, that you look exactly. down upon. Yeah. Yeah. But when you talk about artists as being something, you know, that where they're really playing a role in society and they 
take in the world, they repackage it and make it, um, I'll say experienceable. I'm not, you've never used that word. Yeah. But that's yeah. how it feels to me. Yeah, well, Marshall McLuhan, the media theorist, used to say it's always been the artist who recognizes that the future is the present and uses his work to prepare the grounds for mm. it. So, I mean, I've always felt that artistic interpretation is precisely that. It's interpretation. It's, it's a, a, a focus on subjective experience and intersubjectivity to, to experience artists, to experience another mind and I think that the, the the fraud of objectivity in the world you know I mean don't get me wrong I, I'm all about empirical science and objectivity <laughs> but I also believe that to dismiss the only point of view we ever really get to know mm. which is first person subjectivity to, to, to so easily dismiss that is a is is a wrong in in our society and what I love about art is that it emphasizes the POV it emphasizes the interpretation what I like about cinema even more than documentaries, for example, is that cinema allows us to enter the mind of somebody else for real. Art is the lie that reveals the truth. Um, and I don't know, that, that's just what speaks to me. And so, and so you know, my, my videos, I may be talking to the camera, they may technically be vlogging videos, but I aspire for them to be more cinematic and film-like than to pretend to be anything uh, objective or empirical. Which I love because when you say that, there's no, um, it's not a, a step down in value, mm -hmm. right? So, and what I find so interesting, and, and I just had the very good fortune uh, for anybody out there who's a fan of Jason Zilva, like I am, of watching three of his new videos that haven't been released yet. Oh my God, they're so good. Yeah. In one of them, there's a moment where you're cut so that you're facing yourself. Yeah. And you're talking about duality. Yeah. And what I love is you really do sit at this intersection, which I find incredibly useful, which is you recognize both the power of the co-authored narrative of life, right? Yeah. Co-authoring the things you believe about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You've talked very profoundly about the malleability of the past yeah. through memories and how yeah. we can all um, change those. Yeah. But also, you're incredibly respected in the scientific community, and I know that you get outreach from a lot of very high-level thinkers. You were on Star Talk with yeah, yeah. DeGrasse Tyson, yeah. and so people see that um, you can you can help people experience both. Right? You can help people experience those moments that can only be. And in fact, I wore this shirt, which is Carl Sagan, in your honor. Oh, cool! Um, billions and billions. Yes, because you like have quoted him, and just I don't know you seeing your reverence for him and his work is is really fascinating to me. But yeah. so you get somebody like this who's driven by data, by science, but he so saw the beauty in it. Yeah that I think your words were, when you hear Carl Sagan talk, talking rhapsodic about the universe, yeah. you, it sounds like he's coming. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. you get that, like he's so enraptured 100%. with that moment. So that duality that you represent, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting to me, and the reason it's interesting yeah. to me, so I'm the guy that's trying to show people how they don't have to choose between yeah executing a business, living at the highest levels, being the best in their field, whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. you can want to be the best parent, the yeah. fastest runner of all time, yeah. astronaut or, or business leader, that to me is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But you truly, you're willing to say that I want to be the greatest of all time at that. And, you know, being able to, to show people that I'm not choosing between being an artist being in love with ideas. In fact, the th people always give me credit for being well-researched or whatever. It's because I love the ideas, right? right? I'm chasing my bliss. Yeah. I'm following something that I find innately interesting. Yeah. And what I want people, what I really hope they take away from you is, is that, that duality, that intersection of this, this is a true futurist who understands the technology yeah. and can talk as powerfully about just sort of hard science and yeah. exponential curves and mm -hmm. where it's all going yeah. as he can, and I'm sure we will today, about psilocybin, about mystical experience, yeah. about the, the um, ephemeral things yeah. that make this life worth living. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Carl Sagan. I, I, I do love him, and I, and I have said that to see him talk or to, to hear his words when he, you know, is narrating the pale blue dot, I mean, the, the, the sense of awe and the sense of reverence is clear. And, and the reason I said it sounds like he's having a, a cognitive orgasm <laughs> and, and, and is, is very real. And, and that's a feeling... I think that I chase as a, an existentialist, you know, this, this acute and agonizing self-awareness about the human condition, you know, the, the, the paralyzing 
fear, the, the, the paralyzing incongruity of, of mortal creatures who dream of immortality. <laughs> like, it's just, you know, to, to have emerged from nothing, to have a name, consciousness of self, deep inner feeling, an excruciating inner yearning and desire for self-expression, and yet with all this, yet to die. So we are simultaneously infinite and finite. Tolstoy used to say, man cannot live if he can't find a way to bridge the infinite with the finite. So that is the human condition. And so I think that one of the ways that we do that is by broadening our understanding of what is, you know, peering beyond the possibles. Maybe there's something beyond this mortal coil. And Carl Sagan said it best, through that inquiry, we actually get off. He said, understanding is a kind of ecstasy. So even when he's talking about science and objective empirical measurement of the world and the scientific process and the importance of not falling into dogma, even he's saying that when you experience revelation, when a subjective mind experiences what seems like an objective truth, that becomes an ecstatic experience to that subjective mind. So there is pleasure in understanding. And so I don't think we should hide that or dis dilute that fact. You know, when scientists are really dry, when conveying something amazing, I think they lose half their audience. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, You've seen Contact, right? I love that movie. Thank you right. for bringing it up. <laughs> now, you know when Ellie says she's going through the wormhole yes. and she says they should have sent a poet? Yes. My favorite. The line should be they should have sent Jason Silva. <laughs> and, and I mean that. So Jeez. when I think about what you were saying about the, the academics, they lose their audience. And what I love about the um, Neil deGrasse Tyson story is he yeah. meets Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan changes his life by showing him kindness and really sitting and listening to him and, and helps him tap into the rapture that is um, yeah. that field of study. Mm -hmm. And when, when I hear an idea and then I hear that same idea interpreted through you, I can feel that idea. And there's so much power in the ability to, to be able to communicate feeling. Yeah. And one thing I want to do, I want to put you in context for people because they're seeing you now, right? They're seeing you in 2017 mm -hmm. and um, you make sense in 2017. Mm -hmm. But you don't make sense when you first started doing Shots of Awe however many years ago mm -hmm. and vlogging wasn't a thing right. and people weren't doing micro documentaries. Yeah. No one was thinking of you know, extemporaneously. I mean, you're, you're essentially like an improv rapper yeah. that takes these really complicated ideas, synthesizes them into this flow, mm -hmm. flow on both levels, the mm -hmm. um, Stephen Kotler, Jamie Wheel idea of flow, flow genome, chick set me high, but also the notion of flow as in my flow when I'm rapping, yeah. which is fucking unbelievable. Yeah. And you go on these, you know, sort of lyrical journeys through this idea, smashing these things together. When I was writing the intro for you, that notion of smashing particles together, ideas together in this way that you're able to synthesize those things is, is so incredible. And, and the reason I'm really belaboring this point is I want people to understand all around them right now are these unbelievable ideas that they're not seeing because they're not speaking in the language of emotion. Mm. They're, not, they're not tapping into to actually feeling something about it. Yeah. And going back to like, I want them to see you as the alien that they can all be, right? <laughs> because you actually dared to be you mm. when it was super fucking weird. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people must have been like, what is this guy doing? Like talking to camera, like yeah, yeah, yeah. going, cause there are times I see people in the background. So I know like you're not like in some super isolated right. thing. You're like being a crazy man yeah. on the edge of some sea cliff sure, somewhere. Sure, And the camera gave me the psychological permission slip to do that. Right. So if I was doing that same thing, ranting and raving to myself <laughs> without somebody filming me, then there'd be no difference between me and the crazy man. Right. Um, so it's always been about finding ways to legitimize these meanderings and mm. diving into free association, which is what these riffs are in my videos. It's, 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 it's stream of consciousness in a very real sense. Um, I try to put myself in an altered state before I do it. Um, and you talk about flow, you know, whether you're uh, you know, a freestyle rapper in flow or a jazz musician or an elite athlete, flow is characterized by getting outside yourself. And mm. by outside yourself, I mean beyond the monkey mind, beyond the inner chatter, beyond the inner critic and the questioning mind, the excessive rumination and self-consciousness that keeps you deliberating whether you should ever get out and do something. You know, just overthinking and too much scenario planning, too much neocortical hardware, as Jamie Wheel calls it, cul-de-sacs and error messages running on repeat in your brain and holding you 
back. I mean, we've all suffered from anxiety and self-consciousness and even depression all stem from excessive rumination. But when you finally catch that wave and you're the surfer, there's no time to think anymore. You just start being. The doer and the seer merge. The other thing that happens when you're in flow is your sense of time disappears. So there's selflessness, there's timelessness, there's a sense of effortlessness, right, and flow, and there's a sense of information richness. The kind of associations you're able to make, right, creativity is just connecting things, increases. And for somebody like me whose disposition is timid and who would clearly identify uh, in, my, in my childhood as somebody who was really self-conscious, like just thinks too much, right? Um, sometimes in a way that was not uh, useful to me, socially and or creatively. I was a stiff. I was uptight. I was the guy who never danced at parties, right? Mm. So everybody's having ecstatic moment of no mind on the dance floor, and I'm just thinking, oh, I'm not going to do it. I look <laughs> silly worried about what other people think and so on and so forth. And, you know, sometimes it takes finding the right tool or instrument or medium that you fall in love with so much that is stronger than your self-consciousness and your resistance so that you can finally break through. And I think for me, just the emotional experience of movie watching, the capacity of sitting in the dark and being so deeply affected by a piece of work made me want to make cinema, make media. As a control freak with a God complex, which all filmmakers are, we want to not just control how we feel, we want to control how we make you feel. Mm. David Lenson in his book on drugs calls it the desire for stewardship of internal life. So it's a great line. Stewardship of internal life means you want to essentially pilot the experience that you're having in the theater of your mind's eye, right? You want to be the director in the editing room, cutting the scene, adding the music, adjusting the lighting, and creating the experience that you're having as a viewer. So you're simultaneously creating and perceiving your world at once. Like you're in the movie Inception, real-time authoring of your own subjective dreamscape in real time. I mean, that's where it comes from. So it's like... It's like, I love losing myself in flow, and I'm a total control freak who wants to control the way in which he loses himself and wants to make sure he captures the experience of losing himself so that he can watch it later as a reminder that it is possible. All of it comes, again, from a desire to overcome my own limitations, but also because the alternative, right, to quote David Foster Wallace, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time, the alternative to that is unconsciousness, the default setting, the rat race, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. Anybody who's ever been genuinely inspired, anybody who's ever experienced going down the wormhole like Jodie Foster in contact and said, oh my God, they should have sent a poet, is privy to this sensation of connecting with something larger than yourself. You step aside and you become more than what you were. And so who wouldn't want to return to that? But that, that is fleeting. That is temporary. That is ephemeral. <laughs> that is rare and often haphazard. And so I don't accept these terms. I didn't sign up for this. How do I stabilize ecstasis? How do I stabilize and eternalize inspiration? Mm. You know, last night I sat on my laptop and looked up some of my favorite movie scenes on YouTube mm. and watched them right after the other to get my brain into an aroused state of suggestibility and emotion, to reconnect with feeling alive. Because again, the default setting is not that. That's not how we're wired. <laughs> uh, I want to come back to the movie thing, because I had a, as one of your um, viewers, I had a really interesting experience with what you put out. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, I really hope people are hearing what you're saying, because yeah. whew, I owe you an apology. Mm. The first time I encountered you yeah. on the internet, yeah. I was... I was so blown away. Yeah. The only thing I could think is that you had a magical gift. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking hard work. I wasn't yeah. thinking practice. I was just so mm. astonished mm. and jealous mm. of your ability to do that, mm. that some part of my brain was like, he must be born with that. Because the chasm between where I was and where you were was just, it seemed too inhuman to ever cross. And now I know better, and I know that it's something that you've cultivated. And what I really want to make sure people hear is that this is you overcoming um, introversion. It's you overcoming uh, excessive self-talk in your own mind that would otherwise paralyze you. Because you know the promise that I make to people is if you watch the show, you're gonna be better and perform better than if you hadn't watched the show, right? And so yeah. if they can see you in that context, okay, this is a guy, a result of somewhere I could go and where I could get, oh, yeah. um, then that you know hopefully really sets them free because I, it, it is astonishing, yeah. like how you've been able to leverage flow triggers, an understanding of the brain, a deep understanding of the brain, mm. um, science, technology, pharmacology, all of it that you've done to, to yeah. really take yourself somewhere new. Yeah, well, it, I mean, and, and even, even as I've had 
success, right? Like I've had a lot of moments where I created a video that was beyond anything I thought I could do and it sent my mind spiraling to this really happy place because oh, now that this video exists in the world, the rest of my life will just springboard from that. Wow. Now that I've made this, the rest is inevitably good. Right. Um, but you would think that that high would just stay <laughs> and it hasn't. You know, I've struggled with um, mostly anxiety from the fact that no matter how greatly I'm able to channel my creativity to create something in the world, um, that something is still a temporary thing. You know, I make a video, I can only watch it so many times before I'm sick of it, <laughs> and, and there's a desire for that next thing. But what, what, what will sometimes haunt my dreams still is unarticulated fear. Just like a general feeling of morose anxiety of just what if it all ends? What does it all mean in the end? Like I, I went to see the movie La La Land and I loved every second of it. Um, but this goes back to my view of the human condition. I was simultaneously mourning the film as it ended. Like mm. <laughs> it's, it's to, to, to fully and vividly live in the present is also to be acquainted with the fact that it's expiring as we live through it. And if we were infinite, if we knew we had forever, then it wouldn't matter because then it'd be like, well, I'll watch this again tomorrow. But to know, right, that time is running out, whether we live 90 years or 105, mm. every day is a day you'll never get back. That is still a problem for me. Um, that's how intensely I love the human experience, you know, and yeah, that's how much that I, you, you yeah. said in Spanish, obviously I don't know in Spanish, but it translated the day is escaping me. Si, se me escapa, se me escapa el día. Se me escapa el día. And that is exactly how I feel. Yeah. Like the day I is escaping I can tell we relate on that together mm -hmm. because that's the fire in our belly. Like we wake up agitated. And some would say, right, many psychologists would say, like, well, you owe your success and your work to that angst. Oh, for sure. Make friends with it, because without 100%. it, you wouldn't have achieved what you have achieved. You know, Jamie Wheel told me, he's like, you love your neurosis. You love your pain and your angst because it informs your work. And in a way, in a way, it's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's why I've never really taken an antidepressant, you know, because right. when you read about what most people who experience the polarity, the intense polarity that we do, the highs and the lows, is like, you know, you can get on a pill that will just numb you out, that will just make everything like, eh, mm. eh. But when I feel, eh, it's the beginning of like, I'm not happy with this, you know? Yeah, for um, sure. I'd rather be crying or joyously <laughs> celebrating. It's not a statement you than, hear every day. the, eh, you know? Yeah, no, I totally get that. You've talked about with love, you know? Yeah. That, um, that in many ways it's it's the agony of knowing that it's temporary and that they're so it's either a delicate moment with that person yeah. or just knowing that they're a delicate creature and that nothing lasts forever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, perhaps it is that fleetingness that impregnates such moments with such beauty. You said that we're insatiable, wanting machines, yeah. and that sort of sits at the heart yeah. of the human condition. That as soon as I heard that, yeah. I was like. That defines me. Yeah. I am an insatiable wanting machine, right? Oh, yeah. and, and this is one of the reasons that I rail against people chasing money so hard. Like, right. you'll never have enough, okay? So don't, don't even bother, right? Yeah. Like, the same thing that you feel about however much you're making now, yeah. you're going to feel whether you've got 10, 50, 100 million dollars in the bank. It, it literally won't matter. Yeah. So because we're insatiable wanting machines, mm. How, why yeah. are we insatiable wanting yeah. machines? Is it service? Is it a mm -hmm. hindrance? Mm -hmm. um, it's a, I mean, it's a side effect of our wiring, right? So we are wired to seek out novelty. We get a, a dopamine floods our system whenever we're exposed to the new. Originally, that is what made us explorers. That is what made us spread our seed or semen widely. It was, you know, wired to procreate, wired, you know, wired for novelty, wired for that new mate. Um, we also have hedonic adaptation. Hedonic adaptation means that our hedonic set point, what gives us pleasure today, will not give us pleasure tomorrow through repeated exposure because, again, 
it becomes familiar. Mm. Once it's familiar, it can be dismissed. The brain is on to bigger and better things. I mean, and it's responsible for our greatest achievements as a species, right? Going to the moon, building the internet. I mean, we push the boundaries of novelty. We are a novelty creating engine. We're the cutting edge of evolution. Evolution creates novelty, right? Life moves towards greater novelty and complexity. That's what life is. It's, it's, it's the anti-entropic force in the universe is life. The problem is that if we're not constantly creating, we're restless and depressed, and also that we don't get to enjoy that which we create much either. So the ride is, is characterized by this drive, by this itch with not enough time in a state of appreciation. It's, I think, yeah. it's interesting because I, I feel about it the way that you feel about your neuroses, mm -hmm. which is that for all its problems, there's actually something amazing that it gives me. And, you know, I'll put it in sort of more typical terms and I'll call it hunger, right? Yeah. I'm fucking hungry. Yeah. Like I wake up every day and I want to do something and I want to do something big. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's certain things in our culture that we've decided it's okay to say you want to do on a grand scale. Yeah. Um, but then there's other things that we say that it's not okay to admit that. But I think the reality is everyone can look inside themselves. They know what they really want. Mm -hmm. Like they might be embarrassed to admit it. They might think it makes them a loser, um, but they know. Yeah. They never own it. And because they don't own it, they can't explore it. Because they can't explore it, they're never able to find out if there actually is a path to doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I were talking before the camera started rolling and, and I was saying, impact theory is me. Like if anybody wanted to know, and I used to get asked this all the time when I was at Quest, what would you do if you weren't at Quest? Like if money were no object, what would you do? And I can actually say, I've answered that question, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer is impact theory. And what is impact theory? Impact theory is um, me answering the no bullshit question of what does it take to influence culture, mm -hmm. right? Like at the deepest level. Um, and, and you know why I want to do it. I want to pull people out of the matrix. And why do I want to pull people out of the matrix? Because for me, there's a neurochemical addiction to the moment of awakening. Mm -hmm. I love seeing in somebody else mm -hmm. where they finally get it that, you know, we we're talking about V for Vendetta, that yeah. they realize the prison is fake. Yeah. And this whole time they've been trapped. Yeah. And it's, it's all of their own making. Yeah. And that to me is like the fucking juice. I'm just wired to really enjoy that moment. Yeah. And then if you want to supercharge it, 10X it, a thousand fold, whatever, yeah. let me realize I was a part of it. Yeah. That I helped in some way. Right. Well, that's like, you have that your symbolic immortality, by the way. Yeah. Which is what's great. What, you know, like uh, Ernest Becker says, there's three ways we respond to the terror of meaninglessness in the face of mortality. The first one is the religious impulse. We talked about it last time. Mm. The second one is the romantic impulse where you basically turn your girlfriend or boyfriend into God. And by purging or rubbing up against the infinite, they make you infinite. Mm. Um, but then he ultimately says that to live a heroic life, he talks about heroism, cosmic heroism, is to want to create something that is beyond you. Um, and that's what you're doing with impact theory, which I think is a beautiful thing. Um, but now you want to go really deep for a second? Sure. I know it's all a bullshit lie that is being told to me by my genetics to make sure that I keep moving and pushing forward and trying to help the group so that the group survives, yeah. right? Somewhat irrelevant if I survive. But even in that, like, I just want like myself to know, I'm very aware that even yeah. that is sort of a manipulation that sure. you know the brain plays on you, that sure. I should be incentivized to do something. Right. Oh, but it's positive, Jason, therefore yeah. it's okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the same mechanisms at yeah. work, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but so. being aware of it, I think, puts you in the driver's seat, which I find pretty interesting. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because, because you've also decided, you know, consciousness is mediated by chemistry and you have figured out the knobs and levers approach. What do I need to do in my life to make my subjective experience really enthralling? Mm. Because nature rewards me for doing what I meant to do in this world. If destiny is real, destiny is just you being wired to do what you're meant to do chemically, biologically, genetically, and finding a way to marry that to your subjective experience. Right. And then, you know, follow your bliss and doors yeah. will open for you where there are window with doors. You know, maybe Joseph Campbell was hinting at that. The way, where nature marries subjective experience. Where genetic predisposition and determinism marries the feeling of volition and agency and free will that a creative mind living its bliss feels. You know, maybe that's where they... Right. I think you're really onto something there. So one of the opening lines of yeah. the power of myth is at least the interview series where uh, Bill Moyers asks him, um, you know, what is it uh, about this that makes you think that everybody should pay attention to it, meaning mythology? And he yeah. said, I don't think everybody should pay attention to it just because somebody says it's important. Uh -huh. He said, I think if properly introduced 
to this subject that it will catch you. And he said, you should only do what catches you. And, you know, putting it in, in the language that we were just talking, and it's, you know, when you align that thing that you're wired to do whatever that right. chemical result, and then you follow it. Right. You know, it's caught you. It's not, you're not doing it out of obligation. Right. And that's something so many people are driven by obligation, right? I yeah. should do this. I should yeah. do that. Yeah. Instead of saying, what, what catches me? Like, what yeah, through pulls me through? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it, 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 you know, it's, it's interesting because any creative person at some point or another has trusted the process, has figured out, like, how certain environments can catalyze creativity, has figured out what their triggers for flow are. Whatever uh, woo-woo things fall into place that lead to the magic of creativity, um, you know, I still believe in science, so, so I don't want to. I don't want to surrender to magical thinking. But at the end of the day, like creativity is a form of magic. But maybe there can be an explanation. But for somebody who has an aversion to the concept of faith or believing in in magic, really, um, I still live as if I believe in magic and, and really partake in the creative process. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm aware of the contradictions, but one of the hallmarks of, of all mystical creative epiphanies is a sense of paradoxicality mm -hmm. so that you can hold multiple truths in, in mind at once. Seemingly contradictory ideas are reconciled. Um, in that state of no mind and ecstasy. It's interesting that you say that. So yeah. I used to talk a lot about this. I don't know yeah. why it hasn't been on my mind lately, yeah. but I really believe that one of the abilities you must cultivate if you want to be successful is yeah. the ability to hold two competing ideas in your head at the same time. You like you really, and you really have to know when, so, okay, here I have these two ideas, they compete with each other, and I need to know when to look at this one and really pay attention to it and let my behavior be driven by this, and when to look at this completely contradictory thing right. and know when to lean on yeah. this one. Yeah. It's fucking fascinating. When uh, we leverage that, though, that seems to serve us. Mm. Right? I mean, no question. That, yeah. And maybe that points to the, the sort of, there is no objective reality. Like it's so hard to make things absolute. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, so I have a belief that human potential is nearly limitless. Mm -hmm. Now, why do I throw in nearly limitless? Mm -hmm. I do it partly to, because I'm holding competing ideas in my head. On the one hand, I believe human potential is completely limitless. And then on the other hand, I know if I step off the roof, I'm gonna fall and break something. Right? right? So it's like, and how you reconcile those two things, it's it, it, like well, for you. Me, for me, that causes tremendous uh, anxiety. Really? Well, because I figure as long as we're young and healthy and we take care of our physical hardware, we get enough sleep, we exercise, we eat well, we can more or less take our, our, physio our physiology for granted. Um, and, you know, I've, thankfully, I'm very healthy, but I've experienced health scares in my life mostly self-created, you know, something happened and then I assumed it was the worst. Right. But I can tell you that in the midst of a panic attack, of a true ontological terror, it doesn't matter if you think you're dying or if you think you're going crazy, it's the same thing. Right. You're losing your grip. Right. You're losing your grip even on your own stabilized identity. And I'm working on some videos on the subject because I think, I think mental health you know, de depression and anxiety in this country are chronic. Mm -hmm. In the world, it's one of the most diagnosed illnesses now in the world, like more than physical illnesses. Like, okay, like we have science, we have vaccines, people living longer, healthier, but they're fucking depressed and anxious, you know? And, and we have not good systems, I think, to fill our holes. Yeah, it's so interesting. So one of the driving forces behind founding the company was, yeah. so because people were like, wait, why are you changing you know, yeah. your mission yeah. from Quest, like this whole yeah. new thing? And to me, it's not. It's not a different mission. So at Quest, what we were trying to do is wellness, right? Mm -hmm. So now you can get hyper-focused and say, what's the tactic we're using? And the tactic there was um, to end metabolic disease. But at, mm -hmm. the end of the, at the end of the day, for me, and I'm speaking for myself, not for my partners, we were... Yeah. You know, sort of focus on very different things. But for me, it was there were people in my life that I loved and they were very unhappy, profoundly unhappy. Yeah. And playing the no bullshit, what would it take game, I knew the answer was, you know, my sister was clinically depressed. 
to help her, she had to get in better shape because she, you know, was in this vicious cycle of food. She had a negative ah. self body image. Yeah. The only thing that gave her comfort was food, and that gave her a more negative body image and made her feel like she had no willpower and all that. And so she's just super destructive. So by giving her food that she could choose based on taste and it happened to be good for her, it got her going in the opposite direction. She started to feel better, look better. She was making yeah. one simple choice: eat this bar instead of a, you know, bag of yeah. M&Ms or whatever. And so it got her going, helped build confidence, all that. Um, it was really, really incredible. But it was it was about wellness. It was about wanting to see my sister happy, mm -hmm. right? So the the other side of the coin was always mental happiness. And I believe that we're living through two pandemics right now. Yeah. Pandemic one is the pandemic of the body. It's very easy to see. People yeah. are morbidly obese, yeah. super visible. Yeah. When somebody dies of diabetes, it's crazy. They're literally burning alive from the inside out. It starts at the extremities. They start, you know, cutting off toes and foot, leg, and you know, and, and then you're gone. Mm -hmm. And so it's so visible. Whereas mental illness, on the other hand, the pandemic of the mind, it's invisible. Agreed. I mean, there's a Sam Harris, who is also brilliant and I've consulted with on this topic, says, why are we so concerned with the story? Look, the brain is wired to tell stories. So when you're physically uncomfortable, it will tell a story. It will, that, that discomfort will inform the story and give it a negative tinge. You know, sometimes I feel anxious and when I realize it, I just have to pee. And I was like <laughs> creating this whole story. Um, and one of the things he said is that you think of anxiety just as a peculiar sensation, like when you have an itch. Mm. And when you have an itch, you, you, know, you scratch it if you can, and if you can't, you just like let the sensation pass. And he says, try to do the same thing when you feel anxious. You know, mindfulness meditators talk about that. Just, okay, just let it come in, don't resist it. You can just feel it, breathe through it, and if you don't allow it to like hijack you, right. it will just pass, like just another sensation. Dude, that's really interesting. So yeah. I'll give you one of my yeah. anxiety triggers, yeah. being cold. Okay. So anybody that knows me knows I'm like freaky about being cold. I do not like to be cold. Uh -huh. The reason I don't like to be cold is the yeah. physiological response to cold is exactly the same that I get anyway when I'm anxious. Well, I go. feel like um, slightly shivery. Uh -huh. Like, so if I'm super warm but anxious, I'll feel that same sense of being yeah. shivery. Yeah. So getting cold makes me feel like I'm really anxious uh -huh. about something. So I'm uh -huh. like, the fuck? Mm -hmm. But that analogy is very helpful. I will begin employing yeah. it immediately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems to work for me. I mean, at least definitely for, for exercise. You've been involved with the XPRIZE. I've been heavily involved yeah. in the XPRIZE. Uh, consider myself sort of a junior futurist, if you will. Definitely. Uh, and, and very interested to ask you a question, which, in fact, I'll ask now and then I'm gonna give you a second to think about. Okay. So, because this is, you're gonna resist answering this, but I really want you to take a shot. Okay. Um, peer inside the singularity mm -hmm. and like what's in there. We'll both do it. I won't leave you hanging. They're gonna be absurd. The whole point of a singularity is that you can't see beyond it. Yeah. So, why is he asking us to, to do that? But, so I, I think, and I've thought about this a lot. Say, so you don't even need a second. Let's go. <laughs> I think that to, to quantify... Well, first or, tell people what the singularity is. All right, so the singularity, uh, for those who don't know, in, in Silicon Valley vernacular is kind of like the rapture of, of the nerds. But um, <laughs> it's, it's engineered nirvana. It's heaven. It's, it's human beings transcending mortality, biology, even our cognition as it exists today and phase change. So... It's a metaphor borrowed from physics to describe what happens when you go through a black hole. So the, the, in the upcoming singularity, the one in which humans transcend biology, aside from giving us indefinite lifespans, potentially migrating beyond biology or radically extending our biological hardware, first of all, we'll get rid of the concept of death and might eventually rid us of the concept of time. So I liken it to the end of Vanilla Sky where they sell Tom Cruise the character, the idea of the life extension lucid dream. You live it in the perpetual present um, where everything just improves, like, like a reality rendered at the speed of thought. And so what that looks like will be shaped by whatever that particular mind dreams up. And so I know that for me, it's probably going to look a lot like a, like a collage of all my favorite movies. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it'll be an ageless present in which my favorite scenes from my favorite movies unfold around me forever. That'll be my singularity. All right, I so 
You badly want to keep, time. <laughs> keep going down that rabbit hole, but I'll reel us back in here for a second and say, as somebody who watches your Facebook, it was really, really fascinating what you were doing, showing clips from movies that really moved you. Like you want to talk about inviting someone inside your mind. It was, right. it was because each moment was emotional. Yes, I was feeling yes. what you were feeling, exactly. and so to see like what you saw as beautiful or um, yeah. poignant, yeah. it was so cool. It was like the ultimate. Um, card to send to somebody. In fact, it makes me want to do this for my wife, just to be like, yeah. here are like seven this moments. Is me. This is yeah, me. fuck. This is, this me. is me. Mm. Fuck, dude. Mm. And that that was exactly how it felt watching your stuff. Mm. It was. I'm gonna. Sh this is gonna. You're either gonna get it. You're gonna be like, what? Mm. So my wife knows the story. Mm -hmm. I was um, on a business trip, mm -hmm. and we were out. There was four of us, and because I'm so secure in my relationship with my wife, like. It, it was fun to be around other people who were like doing the sort of courtship ritual, but to be on the outside of that. But so because they were all doing it, it was like at the yep. heightened state. Mm -hmm. And I had this sweatshirt on and I needed to take it off. And I turned to the woman next to me, I said, this is gonna be oddly intimate, but will you please hold the bottom of my shirt for me so I can take my top shirt off without it coming off? And so she reached over and did it and I took my shirt off and she was like, that really was like strangely intimate. And I thought, wow, we've shared, like it's such a small moment, right? Mm -hmm. But it's so real mm -hmm. and like so tangible mm -hmm. that it really did like have this intimacy mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And some of the clips that you put were small like that. Mm -hmm. And so they had this like really real intimacy where I felt like I fucking just stepped into mm -hmm. your mind a bit. Mm -hmm. It was so fucking interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I will be doing you're that so, You're so welcome. Man. Talk to me about where do you want to see cinema go? It's interesting. I, uh, in trying to be as as ambitious creatively, but also pragmatic, you know, I, my as my clips have resonated, um, there's it's created an interest in in me for other projects and opportunities and sure. for other people's agendas. So I get invited quite a bit to come inspire audiences at like big corporate keynotes for like IBM and Intel and Cisco, and that's great. Um, I'm lucky that I get to do that and share my mind with these people and talk about singularity in the future and it's all great. The new show with Origins is great, you know, National Geographic, major platform. I hope it does extraordinarily well. Um, I would also like to focus and put more resources into doing, you know, special edition video content. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm an artist, not an art factory. Sometimes having to constantly be pushing out content doesn't allow me to labor lovingly on making a video perfect. So I guess it's figuring out a, a system that um, financially makes sense for me to do that. Like you always want to do your thing and you're not sure, yeah. you're not sure if your thing has mass market appeal. <laughs> You know, and it's like, oh, like Facebook is getting more crowded and the algorithms are like making it harder for people to, mm -hmm. even your own fans to see your content, you know? And so it's just like, you know, well, what does one do? And, and you know. It's interesting because anybody out there who wants to make content, like watch his content, one thing that you're gonna see is how much, he has sort of three layers of content. So yeah. layer one is um, completely unguarded and intimate. Yeah. And um, it's fun to watch you dip in and out of what people think is Jason Silva, yeah. right? So it, I feel like I'm just one of your boys and we're hanging, we're yeah. eating bitter ballins yeah. and you know, having a chat about the view and yeah. you know, all of that. And then there's the art machine yeah. where your you know, shots of all that coming out yeah. every week, whether you yeah. want it to or not. And it's right. beautiful to watch you get into that state and really yeah. create this stuff. And then there's this new content that yeah. you're about to put out, yeah. which we just looked at and it's, it is artful. Thanks. Right, it's artful on every level, and to me, as as a fellow content creator, like that's the new game, right? That's the new paradigm that everybody is playing. Is what what are the layers to your creation? Because you can't like not everything that we do can be this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's the fastest way to go broke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the audience is a certain percentage of the people out in the world, right? Mm -hmm. They want what we're doing. They want more. They want different ways to engage in it. And the fact that you're delivering on that in all these sort of inception-like layers to your mm -hmm. personality is, mm -hmm. is pretty intriguing. Thanks, bro. Well, we'll have to keep it going, you know? Yeah, no question. Hopefully I, hopefully I can. <laughs> no, you will, you will, man. Look, in, and that goes back to what I was saying, that I really hope people see you in the context of somebody who um, 
gave birth to something before it was a thing, right? To, to be Jason Silva now is almost a, a verb. You know, it's like mm -hmm. other people trying to do what you do, get in your flow states and create the kind of yeah. um, things you're creating. It's really interesting and it's beautiful to watch you push and going back to we are insatiable wanting machines. I'm glad, as, as somebody who loves your content, I'm yeah. glad that you're not satisfied. All right, one last question. Sure. What's the impact mm -hmm. that you want to have on the world? Ah. <sighs> I mean, you know, it certainly is life affirming and elating when you come across somebody uh, who has resonated with your content um, because what it feels like is the opposite of fear. You feel your power to do good and that's awesome. Like feeling, not just, not feeling your power, right? This is not like, I am powerful. Feeling your power to do good feels really good <laughs> because it's like, oh, so I guess I can do something about my uh, feeling of impotence in the face of where the world is going with politics or in the face of like whatever it is that, that gets you down, but that, but that you can do good. So you can respond to that malaise, you know, you can respond to the doom and gloom. Um, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's either that or cower away and die, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, I think I want something similar to what, um, what you probably want as well, positively impact mm. people, like to, to, be, to be net good, you know, that what, that what we do in the world raises the stage for, for others as well by, you know, that's, that would be the goal. I love that. <laughs> Where can these guys find you online? Uh, Facebook is great. Facebook.com slash Jason L. Silva, or just look up my Facebook page, which is verified. It's easy to find. Um, Instagram at Jason L. Silva, Twitter at Jason Silva. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on, I'm on all the social media platforms, a quick Google search. They should be able to find it, but definitely for the videos, um, Facebook is where I've seen the most growth. So I appreciate when people come in there and engage and share. It's good. And don't forget the new show, which I'm super hyped about. Yes. Origins. Origins, the journey of humankind is going to sort of chronicle the story of humanity through a modern lens. So we, we start with today and then we trace back the origins of things like language, fire, transportation, war, and we trace these things to their origins, to the, to the moments uh, in which humanity was witnessing the next big thing that transformed uh, humans into who we became. Mm. It's going to be really good and uh, yeah, National Geographic Channel. Nice. I'm super excited, man. Thank you so much for coming on the Thanks show. Thanks for having me, bro. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you man. <laughs> All right. Guys, I hope that you were paying attention to the links he was giving you to follow him socially because I'm telling you, this guy is unbelievable. The way that he's able to synthesize ideas and DJ them, it's one of the most accurate things you're ever gonna be, uh, you're ever gonna hear people say about him is he is a DJ of ideas. And I think that is so true. And the way that he's able to combine novel ideas to literally collapse your reality tunnel, as he says, and get you decentered and seeing the world in a totally new way. It is absolutely astonishing. And from the smallest moments that he's able to capture and and stretch out and really make you feel something to the grand moments, the way that he talks about the cosmos and can really invite you in to the most complicated and seemingly unreachable ideas that we have at the deepest levels of neuroscience, cosmology, all of it, but he makes it accessible and he does it by making it emotional. He's gonna make it tangible. He's gonna make you feel something. He is the great translator and he is able to take the most audacious ideas and make you feel like you can make them your own and go out and do something with them. He is an artist, he is a poet, and he is a scientist, even though he would never use that word. But it is beautiful, the dichotomy that he represents and the way that he's able to bring it all together. There is, in my opinion, no human being that is anything like Jason Silva. So go check him out. Jason, thank you so much, man. <laughs> thank you so, so much, awesome bro. Wow, what, a, what, a, what an honor. Thank Absolutely. you. Guys, thank you. Guys, please give it up for oh, Jason Silva. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. That was awesome, dude.
Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Impact Theory. If this content is adding value to your life, our one ask is that you go to iTunes and Stitcher and rate and review. Not only does that help us build this community, which at the end of the day is all we care about, but it also helps us get even more amazing guests on here to share their knowledge with all of us. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this community. And until next time, be legendary, my friends. 